to talk to you about how to live through a bad day. And I want to do it by looking at the Lord himself. Matter, matter of fact, a lot of people don't realize this. We, we, do, we teach you on the miracles of Jesus. I've done a series on the miracles of Jesus. I've done a series on the parables of Jesus. I've taught the different aspects of the life of Christ. I've taught through different books of the Bible, and all in and out through the Gospels. And you know what's interesting? A lot of times we think that the teachings of Jesus are just related to the, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. Did you know that Jesus actually was teaching very profound tr truth right up to his last breath? As a matter of fact, some of the most profound sermons that he ever taught were actually when he was on the cross. I want to look at there's actually seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. We're going to look at five, today one, and then four more leading up to Easter. As we look at Jesus' encouragement of how to live through a bad day. Now, I know this is a little bit of a heavy message. I want to try to lighten it up so we can breathe a little bit easier in church. And to do that, I did hear a funny story about Bob and Earl. Bob and Earl were baseball enthusiasts. They loved baseball, good buddies their whole life. And matter of fact, they got into the retirement years, and there's so many MLB, there's so many games, the, the, the national, uh, the baseball league, it's just so many. They said, look, we're going to go half of them. We're going to do like 60 games. And, and they would do that in their retirement years. And here's what they said. Listen, they made a deal one day. They said, look, whoever dies first, you go to heaven you got to come back and tell me if there's baseball in heaven. Now, let me qualify. That's not biblical, but this is a joke. Just breathe easy. <laughs> Nobody's coming back talking to you from heaven. But anyway, and so sure enough, Bob dies talking about a bad day. He dies. But he gets to heaven, and he finds out in heaven, he says, there's baseball. So he comes back, and he tells Earl. He says, Earl, one night. He goes, Earl, Earl. Earl would say, Bob, is that you? Yeah. He goes, ha, huh, listen. Earl, I got some good news, but I've actually also got some bad news. He goes, well, tell me the good news first. I said, well, it's all. He goes, Earl, there's baseball in heaven. He goes, that's great news. He goes, what's the bad news? I just found out you're actually pitching tomorrow. <laughs> How many know that's bad news? All right, if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke chapter 23, the gospel of Luke chapter 23. As a church, as we move towards really the body of Christ globally during the season of Lent, as we move towards Easter, there's an important day before Easter, and that day is actually called Good Friday. Matter of fact, there's no Easter resurrection day without the Friday before it. Now, we call it Good Friday. I think it's important to define terms. We call it Good Friday, but it's not good in the traditional sense of how that word is defined. We would call something good based upon it being nice or happy, comfortable. Oh, man, that restaurant, how was it? It was good. What are we saying? The food was good. Man, how's that new dress or how's that new coat? Man, it felt good when I put it. Mean, so we define good or goodness based upon something that's nice or some experience, man, that was a good experience. So when we say that Friday was good, it's not good in the traditional sense of how we define the term good. Matter of fact, for Jesus, it was anything but good. Jesus was actually the Passover lamb. What does that mean? The night before Good Friday, he sold for 30 pieces of silver. Then, he then experiences compromise and corrupt courts throughout the night. He comes in the morning and he faces an angry mob he then experiences total rejection from his friends. Just think about that. Aren't your friends supposed to be there when you're going through tough times? The only one that was at the cross was John. Well, Peter was in a distance. Nobody else was there. Jesus experienced brutal beating and vicious bloodshed, rejection, pain. It wasn't good for Jesus. And yet, we call it Good Friday. We call it Good Friday because of the goodness of God that was demonstrated by sending his son Jesus to die for us. Actually, it was good for us, but it wasn't good for him. Now, let me say this. I am in no way trivializing bad days because there are good days and there are bad days in our contemporary society. And again, we often evaluate bad days as often accumulation of a lot of bad moments. For example, 
waking up in the morning, you go and you realize your car has a flat. That's not a great start. And then you realize, oh my gosh, you know, okay, I got to change this flat, but you, but you have a young child. They start throwing up, which then throws off your schedule for the day. And a young parent, parent said, amen. Oh, wait, it's Sunday and you got to get your kids dressed. Wait, should they go to church? Should they not go to church? You got to get, you got to go to church. And how do you get them dressed? Because you can only find one sock. Where did the other sock go? It went to hell in the dryer. I don't know where the other sock went. How do you lose? Where does the other sock go? So I get it, bad days start kind of bad, a little bit bad, a little bit more bad, a little bit bad, and boom, it's just a full-blown full blown bad day. I'm not trivializing bad days. Obviously, this is a much more intense scenario, and yet, and yet sometimes we're in senseless conflicts that start a little bit small, and then it erupts into some big, violent storm of words that are communicated in a relationship. How did it get there? We need a biblical a kind of a biblical roadmap to get through a tough, tough day. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, God's word directs us with what I would call a biblical framework. What is our focus when we're going through a tough time? Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. Everybody say lay aside. Notice there's two things we lay aside. Number one, to lay aside every weight, and the sin. Sometimes we are careful to quickly say, hey, we got to lay aside sin. But there's also weights. What are weights? Weights are things that burn you down. Lay aside the burdens and lay aside the sin that does what? It, it hinders your race. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto who? Say it. Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Pastor, what is the biblical framework that we should look towards, the biblical framework that we should actually look towards and that we should consider when we're going through a bad day is we actually should look to the cross, but not just the cross as a noun, but the words that actually came from the cross from the Lord himself. What were the words from the cross? We're gonna evaluate them because they bring deep assurance to our soul. Do you know how powerful it is when you're going through a hard time and there's somebody that you trust, somebody that you respect, somebody that you may even esteem, and they come alongside you with words of assurance? And look, it doesn't matter how tough it is if somebody lifts you with their words. I'm going to share with you that Jesus himself and his words provide the biblical framework, but we got to look to the cross. We have to direct our pain somewhere. If you don't direct your pain to the cross, you'll anesthetize your pain looking at, pointing it somewhere else. You'll put your pain in substance abuse. You'll put your pain in illicit relationship. Only to think that if you'll do enough of this, what's this, whatever that is, that it'll somehow anesthetize your pain, cover your pain, and heal your pain, but it doesn't heal your pain. Only when you look to the cross is your pain healed. Only when you look to the cross is your pain healed. So we are to look. Everyone say, look. Who do we look? We're to look to Christ. In Luke chapter 23, let's look at how assurance, the assurance that comes from the words of Jesus. You know, it's amazing to me when I study this out, the patience that Jesus had, the compassion, the empathy that he had. Here it is. In his very last moments on the earth, in his dying moments, he still is not considering himself but thinking about others. Luke chapter 23, verse 39 to 43. Here is a scene. Jesus, there's actually three men that are dying on the cross that day. Not just one, not just Jesus. They're all dying as criminals. Jesus as an alleged criminal for blasphemy, for declaring that he's God and the king of the Jews. And yet these two guys, there are other legitimate criminals. There's one on the right. He's a criminal. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what this person did, other than they're a criminal. But then there's another person on the other side of Jesus, Jesus is in the middle, that he's dying. Crucifixion was a form of torture in the first century. It's very, uh, just a very graphic, gruesome experience. And, and they're crucified literally before all the public. 
The last words of Jesus, there are seven statements. These are some of the statements that he made. Each week we're going to be looking at different ones. Each one, listen, are filled with encouragement to people going through a bad day. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. He mocked him. He scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by yourself. Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man, speaking of Jesus, hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, this guy, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is an extremely important passage in all of the Bible because I believe it defines for us the how, the when, the where, and the why of our salvation. The how, the when, the where, and the why of our salvation. Uh, it's amazing that this, in this chapter, in these verses, they are rife, they are filled with assurances it's amazing how many people that I talk to today who I'll say to them, I say, you know, do you know Christ or, or, you know, are you going to heaven? And here's what they'll say. This is important what I'm about to say. They'll say, I sure hope so. Anybody that says they hope that they're going to heaven doesn't know Jesus. Because when you know Jesus, you know that you're going to heaven. If you hope so, it's because you don't know so. But Jesus brings assurance. Everybody say Assurance. That when you know Jesus, you know in your heart that you're right. Because your knowing is not based upon your works. It's based upon your trusting the one who ultimately did the work on the cross. You have to understand that. So I want to clear up any ambiguity that you may have as individuals. This is an actual message that you want to send to your friends. You want to send it to your neighbors. Because there's a clear plumb line. It's not I hope so. You've got to know so. And your confidence is not based upon your behavior. It's based upon your trust in the all-knowing God who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And your trust in that cross, in the work of the cross. To get through a tough day, we have to have assurance from God. So the first criminal, the Bible says he scoffed. The word scoffed, if you look at it, it's actually the Greek word blasphemo, where we get the English translated word blasphemous. It's to mock. It's to demean. So here's the first guy. Hey, if you're, let me give you the editorialized translation. Hey, if you're really who you say that you are, simple. Get yourself down. And by the way, why don't you get us down while you're doing it? That's literally what he said. This guy over here. Hey, he's talking past Jesus. Hey, what are you talking about, man? This guy, he's done nothing wrong. This guy starts preaching to that guy. I don't know if he's been to Bible college, probably not. But he was preaching from the cross. This guy right here, who had never been to seminary, he'd never been to Bible college, he probably had never been through next steps at Church of the King. Now that's tragic. Just a little input there. But anyway, this guy begins to preach some of the most profound theology in all the Bible. I want to look today at the four statements that this dying man knew from the cross. Number one, if you have your Bible or you're taking notes, those that are following online with version, it's really important. You can download our app and you can follow along with the notes there as well. I want to talk to you today about four things the dying man, this man, this man knew. Number one, he knew that he would face God after death. When the first criminal starts insulting Jesus, the second man rebukes him. Look at verse 40. Don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? In other words, don't you realize the seriousness of this situation? You're a few seconds from eternity. You're dying on a cross. And you're insulting Jesus. Hey, hey, buddy, don't you get what's going on? 
You're about to step from this life into the next. Don't you even fear God? He recognized Jesus was God. Don't you fear God? It's amazing how people don't fear God. It's amazing how they don't realize. It's amazing to me in our culture how people don't even reckon with death itself. If you're young, ah, it's a long time from now. The people that don't think about it today, it's, well, you know what, I just die and I'm just kind of, that's it. No, no, no. The Bible's real clear that when you die, there's two places you go. You either go to heaven, you go to hell. You spend eternity with Christ in heaven or you go to a real bad place. The Bible teaches that. Matter of fact, the Bible is very clear that death is not the end. It's actually just the beginning. I don't care if you live 80 years, 90 years. Somebody recently, I don't know where I saw this on, you know, this artificial intelligence. They're about, they're close to create a human. I, they, no, that's a robot that looks like a human. They're not made in the image, the likeness, and the dominion of God. They're not. Because by the way, by the way, the scripture is real clear. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27. Everyone must die. How many times? Come on, say it. That was weak. Everyone must die. How many times? Say it. Once. I don't care what Hollywood says. You know, like we're in a reincarnation, man. Like, you know, like I didn't do really well in my last life. I've come back as a roach. I'm hoping to migrate, you know, soul migration to a higher level of existence. Co, I could do good. No, no, that's, 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 that's not scriptural. Even some religious systems say that you kind of didn't really do it. You kind of go in a holding chamber, see if you can work some things out, kind of make it up, gravitate up to a higher level. That's not biblical. Everyone must die. How many times? Say it, say it. Once. And after that, judged by God. Can I tell you this? The Christian is not judged by God when they die based upon whether they go to heaven. It's based upon, their, it's based upon what they're going to do in heaven. We don't do good works to get to heaven. We do good works because we're going to heaven. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. So I've checked. The mortality rate, it's still at 100%. Everybody's going to die. I know that, I remember my grandfather died at 68. I was like, gosh, that's so old. How many of y'all my age are saying now, 68, that's kind of young. Come on, somebody. It's like, that's not bad. What is it now that the new 60 is the new 40? That's not true. But anyway, here we go. Everybody's going to die. And this man knew he was going to die. Benjamin Franklin said there are two things that you can be sure of. Death in the United States of America, taxes. All right, I'll move on. (laughs) Number two, he knew that he'd also sinned against God. Look at verse 41. We deserve to die For our crimes. This guy is preaching to that guy. We deserve to die. That's actually called confession. Everybody say confession. It's actually a lost art in our culture, confessing when you're wrong. We confess. The word confession is the word homo legeo. It means to say the same word. And you confess first Christ as your Lord and Savior. You recognize your need for Christ. You recognize that you're empty. You're spiritually impoverished without Christ. And that's why Paul wrote to the church at Rome, and he says this in Romans chapter 10. He says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be what? Everybody say it. Saved. For with the heart one believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, confession, you believe in your heart, but you confess through your mouth. What do you confess? Your need for Christ and your declaration that he's the Lord and Savior of your life. And then as you are a Christian, there are times when the Holy Spirit convicts you, when you've transgressed God's law, God's word, and you need to repent of sin. By the way, that's another thing that we don't talk about. You have to confess. You have to own it. By the way, a mistake is not a... Let me say this. All mistakes are not sins, but all sins are mistakes. Just don't get them confused. A mistake is missing a U-turn. A sin is a sin against the Holy God. And you've got to own it. In other words, when you sin, when you sin against a person, when you sin against God, when you sin against God, you, you've got to own it. First John chapter 1, verse 9. This man, this man is owning it. He's preaching a message to us. Own your offense. Don't obfuscate. Don't circumvent. Don't go around. Don't shade it. Don't color. Just own it. And there's liberation in the soul when you own your wrong. He's preaching to that man. That man wouldn't own it. 
1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our what? Say it. Sins. He's faithful and just to what? Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all. So here's how it works. We do the confessing. God does the cleansing. We don't do the cleansing. Listen, and he doesn't do the confessing. We confess. God, I'm wrong. Boom, he forgives. That man is owning. He's owning his. We deserve to die. Yeah. The question is, how does this work? James chapter 2, verse 10. For one person, there's a lot of confusion and ambiguity. Okay, how do I know? What do I confess? Am I right with God? Well, I kind of done better than I've kind of than other people. Am I right with God? That's the wrong table to evaluate from. James chapter 2, verse 10. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is guilty as a person who has broken all of God's law. We all deserve to die because of our sin. If you commit one sin, and there's nobody perfect. So we love to evaluate ourselves based upon being better than somebody else, based upon we've done a little bit better. I mean, we've helped widows, we kind of fed people at Thanksgiving, we've done some good. And so, so a lot of people think, here's how, how, how it works. You know, I've kind of done some bad things, ooh, the scale's going down. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But I've done a lot of other good things, I've helped the poor. I've done, okay, so, so hopefully you get up to heaven, you go, and you know, God, here I am, I hope it works out. That's the hope so crew. The people that say hope so, they think that God grades on a curve. Now, I like teachers that graded on a curve. Y'all did terrible. The highs of 42, that's an A today. That's not how it works in heaven. I wish it did, but it doesn't work that way. And what's so unfortunate is there are people even in the church of Jesus Christ that believe that God grades on a curve. God doesn't grade on a curve. That's not how it works. Let me just expose some thought process here, all right? So let me just do something real quick, all right? I want everybody at all of our locations, those that are watching online, I want you to lean into this. So let's just evaluate right here, kind of the contemporary paradigm and thought process that people have that God, you know, grades on a curve. All right, so let's have zero is really bad, like incarnate evil, 100 is like a really good person, all right? So, so let's grade some people. You guys ready? Say yes. What if you said no? I'm still doing it. All right, here we go. So, so let's say... Um, Let's do Hitler, all right, okay. So would Hitler be a zero or a hundred? Where, where would Hitler be in there? Anybody, let's just, just draw a number. Hitler, what's his number? Okay, so he's right here. So he's way over here, okay. How about, um, let's do Mother Teresa, right? Okay, Mother Teresa, where, she's not perfect, but she's gotta at least be somewhere here. So, so, so what would her number be? She, 90s, okay, I hear a 90, okay, 85, 90, maybe higher. I, she did incredible good. She was, according to her memoirs, a little grumpy at times, so she can't be, a, you gotta back it down a little. I'm, it's her, I, I'm a big follower, trust me, I, she's amazing. But, can't, she, can't, she, so, so let's, so 90, let's give her, let's give her an, a 93 is an A. Let's uh, at least a 93, right? She's gotta get an A, absolutely. Okay, who's the next person? Oh, oh, Pastor Steve, 95. <laughs> That's in my notes. I don't know who put it there. I'm just telling you, it's in the notes. It is amazing how we grade. Matter of fact, you ought to let your spouse grade you. That, that, that would probably get a pretty good assessment there, right? Now, let me, let me, let me just tell you, uh, this whole thing is trying to expose the erroneous concept that God grades on a curve. It's not, you know who did better than, and we do good works, but we don't do good works to get saved. We do good works because we're saved. That, that's important. Let me give you a funny joke here. I, I do a lot of, you, you guys all hear about the St. Peter jokes, right? The pearly gates. And so so let, let me give you one. This is, this is a joke, okay? Don't send me an email. That's not scriptural. I got it. I really got it. So I, you'd be surprised all the emails I get. I don't read them. But anyway, <laughs> delete. All right, here we go. But you're loved by God. All right, here we go. <laughs> so, so, so let me keep going. All right, so there's three people that get up to the pearly gates with Peter. It's, um, it's a teacher, it's a doctor, and a lawyer. They die, they get up there, and uh, they go, St. Peter, so good to see you. He goes, we got a problem. We're like overcrowded today. Like, I, I don't, yeah, I, we really can't fit anybody. Well, okay. Look, it's really overcrowded, but here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a test. 
And if you get it right, we'll squeeze you in. But, but you got to get it right. Like, you got to know exactly. Okay, we'll start with the teacher. About 1900, um, there's a big boat. It sunk. There's a crash. It was terrible. And uh, what's, the, what's the boat? You should know this. The Titanic? Oh, good. You know it. Come on in. You made it. Come on in. Come on in. Teacher, into heaven. You made it. The doctor, you've had a little bit more education. I know this PhD is on the teacher level, but this most of the doctors, you know, so we gotta, we got to get this harder. Um, how many people died on that boat? Oh, pfft. I just saw the movie, 1503. You made it. Come on in, doc. You made it. To the lawyer. Hmm. All right. Name all their names. I don't know. That's what I thought. See ya. <laughs> Pastor, you say, do lawyers go to heaven? I'm not sure. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> of course they do. There's 10. <laughs> My dad's an attorney, so I, I can do all this stuff. But here's the point. I don't care if you grade somebody a 99.9, they're not perfect. And guess what? The Bible says if you break one law, you're a lawbreaker, which means you need a savior to, to, to save you from your sins. In other words, nobody's good enough to get into heaven based upon their works. So anybody that ever says, I hope so, doesn't know so. Jesus gives assurance. Everybody say assurance. That's not pride. That's not arrogance. That's assurance, not in your behavior, but in your trust in the almighty God who sent his son to die on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. This is good news. This is good news. All of us have sinned, Romans 3.23, and come short of the grace of God. You've sinned, I've sinned. We all need a savior. It's not, do I get up there, I kind of hope I did better. And we are into good works, but good works does not make you right with God. Good works are because you're right with God and Christian growth, but it doesn't get you into heaven. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Number three, what did this man know? He's preaching. This guy's preaching. Jesus is preaching. This guy's preaching. Luke chapter 23, verse 41. We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man, he's preaching. But this guy, he's not done anything wrong. We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man has never, ever done anything wrong. You know what he recognized? He recognized the sinless nature of Christ. You know, there's these movies out, and you'll see them, whether it's The Last Temptation of Christ over the years. And, you know, they've got these movies about Jesus. Not all of them. Let me clarify that. But there are some movies that typify that Jesus is struggling, you know, with sin, and he has kind of an illicit affair with this kind of lady. And it, yeah. Can I tell you something? That is all unscriptural rubbish, garbage. Jesus was sinless and perfect. He was 100% God, but 100% man. An imperfect sacrifice cannot redeem imperfect people. It has to be a perfect sacrifice to die for imperfect people to redeem us, to redeem us. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For God made Christ who never sinned. Any book you read, any novel you read, any movie you see. Well, you know, Jesus, you know, he just kind of, he had his issues too. No, he had emotions and he cried and there was pain and there was human grief. But there was no transgression of God's law. He was perfect a perfect sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God. He was a perfect Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the what? The sin of the world. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we may be right with God through Christ. So here's how it works. Here's how it works. So, so the perfect sacrifice died on the cross. His name is Jesus. Watch this. Watch this. To, to redeem us from all of our anger, all of our lust, all of our pride, all of our sin. Here's how it works. This is the gospel. Any other gospel is a false gospel. The gospel of works is a false gospel. It's, it, is from the, it is a doctrine of demons. 
Because you're not saved based upon works. You're saved based upon the work of Christ on the cross. I don't know how to get it any clearer than this. I don't usually preach this strong, but we've got to be shaken into the biblical truth here. Jesus is perfect. We are imperfect. That means he took our sin, all of our lust, greed, sin, was put upon Christ at the cross. And guess what? He put his righteousness on us. Our unrighteousness went on Christ. His righteousness went on us. And we are saved and right. Everybody say right. We are right with God based upon his works, not our works. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The, the life, death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We trust Christ. We're saved from our sins. And, we're, and listen, and you can be sure of that. Anybody that says they hope so doesn't know so. Because what they're hoping so is that their good works outweigh their bad. I'm grateful that when I get to heaven, I don't have to hope that my good works outweigh my bad. Because I've done some bad works. And I've done some good works. But it's his work. It's his work. This man's done nothing wrong. He's done nothing wrong. Yeah. Number four, last one. He knew only grace could save him. It's unfortunate that at times we believe that Christianity is a... I've even heard this. You just kind of pull yourselves up by your bootstrap or religion. If I just try hard, if I'll do better. Matter of fact, I heard a country song yesterday. Working out. Yesterday. And the song was, I'm not going to get it exactly right. I was trying to figure out which one it was. And I was like, okay, which one? That, but, it, but here's the essence of it. It's on a porch. And, and the whole point was, if I work real hard, I'm trying real hard to get to heaven someday. That's so unscriptural. You don't work real hard and hope you get to heaven someday. That's not how it works. Y'all do know what happens when you listen to country music backwards, right? You get your wife back, your dog back, your truck back, your job back. Sorry, if you're offended, I don't care either. And I kind of like some country music. But anyway, here we go. Let me get back to the Bible. Verse 42, I'm sorry. Here it is. Jesus, remember me. That's so profound. Here's what that man was saying. I can't save myself. Where are you right now? Are you still trying to save yourself? Why won't you just humble yourself and say, I need Christ. I need the forgiveness of sins. I, I, need, you. I need his righteousness. I'll give you my unrighteousness. I need your righteousness. Remember me. And by the way, here's what Jesus said. Today. Everyone say today. Today. today you will be with me in paradise. Today. Boom. You're with me. Not, you're in a holding tank. So today. Today you're going to be with me. This man knew grace. Oh, that we would know grace. Grace. What is grace? It's God's riches at Christ's expense. What is grace? It's God doing for us what we can never do for ourselves. When I came to Christ at 19 years old, I remember at that Bible study, I was invited by two girls. I couldn't save myself. I couldn't change myself. You may be able to fix your business. You may be able to fix this or fix this relation, but you can't fix your soul. Only God can fix your soul. Only God can forgive you of your sin. You got to see this. And I remember when I cried out, I said, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Oh, man, he washed me and he cleansed me. And then he gave me his gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then that means you're born again. And you're made right with God. You don't do right to get with God. You're made right. I'm brought into a right relationship with God. That humbles you. It's all level at the cross. It's all level. So what is the assurance for the, for the believer here? I want everybody to hear me. For the believer, here's your assurance. If you're going through a bad day today, you can know that you know in your heart that you belong to Christ and God's got you. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know it's dark, but you got to know God's got you. I know that's not good English, but he's got you. He's got you in the palm of his hand. How many of y'all grateful that God's got us? Come on, in the palm. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. That's good. Okay, but for the unbeliever, for the unbeliever, you can have an assurance in your heart. Matter of fact, I want everybody to bow their heads. 
all across our locations right now, those that are joining us online right now, the Holy Spirit is here right now. God loves you. God's not mad at you. That thought that God's mad at us, he's just trying to get us. No, God's not out to get you. He's out to forgive you. He's out to heal you. He's out to restore you. Do you know Christ? Do you know that you know and you're knower? If you die today, you're ready to stand before God. You can know that. You can have assurance. That's not arrogance. That's biblical proof in your heart that you know that you've been forgiven of your sins and you belong to God. But you've got to confess that with your mouth. In just a moment, the, Bi- uh, the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to ask for a show of hands in just a moment. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I'm not sure about my relationship with God. I'm not sure if I die today, I'm ready to stand before God. I want to pray for you, whoever you are, whatever location, those in the jails and prison, those that are watching literally online around the world, I want to pray for you. If you say, Pastor, I need Christ, I'm not sure about my relationship with God, you need to recognize all of us have sinned, and it's Jesus Christ paid for our sin. You've got to trust in the work of Christ. Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. If that's you, the count of three. I want you just to lift your hand up high so I can see it. All of our locations. One, two, three. Quickly hold your hand up high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you up top. Every single one of you. It's awesome. God bless you way up top right here. Pastor, pray for me. God bless you, sir. God bless you right there. God bless you, sir, as well. It's awesome. Church family, can we pray with those that are trusting Christ? This is literally the most important part of our service. All of it is important, but this moment where we have an opportunity to respond to Jesus, can we pray together? Come on, all of our locations, let's pray together. Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. Wow, what an amazing message. I am so excited to be continuing this profound series. And if you just made the decision to give your life to Jesus, we just wanna say congratulations. This is the biggest decision you could ever make. And from this moment forward, you are a new creation. So I encourage you, leave everything that needs to stay behind you in the past, your guilt, your shame, all of your mistakes. From this moment forward, you are brand new. And I am celebrating with you as you start this brand new journey with Jesus. Yes, this is an incredible decision that you've made. And hey, I just wanna ask you to do me a quick favor. Will you fill out the link in the chat room or on the screen and let us know that you've made this decision? We would love to know one, but we would also love to be able to partner with you and to walk with you as you begin this new journey. And so please take that second, fill it out, and we cannot wait to connect with you soon. We are so excited for you. Well guys, we cannot wait, like I said earlier, to continue the series next week. It is gonna be so powerful, but we will see you next week, same time. Same place, see you soon.